Tonight, stalking Kawhi. As the free agent touches down in Toronto, anxious Raptors fans follow every move. We've got the latest on what it all means. I'm gonna check it out for sure. We look at the reluctance of young Canadians to vote, even as they say they're more optimistic than most. It is the birthday of the country. Well, he has commandeered it. And Donald Trump's plan for the 4th of July divides Americans again. Is it about celebrating independence or celebrating him? This is The National. To say Raptors fans want Kawhi Leonard to stick around is like saying the Beatles were popular. Bit of an understatement. But today, the Kawhi frenzy gripping Toronto hit a whole new level as a sudden drama played out live in real time. Greg Ross was part of a growing crowd right near the epicenter. It's a frenzy that started when one Raptors fan spotted Raptors president Masai Ujiri and general manager Bobby Webster inside the Hazelton Hotel. He sent out pictures and videos of his encounter. Not long after that, I was able to confirm for myself that they were indeed here having lunch. I watched as Ujiri and Webster went up an elevator here at the hotel. But what really kicked this frenzy into high gear were rumors that Leonard himself was also coming here to meet them. Leonard was rumored to be on a plane coming from L.A., a private jet owned by the company that runs the Raptors. It touched down in Toronto this afternoon. Many speculating those climbing down the stairs included the King of the North himself and his uncle Dennis. Even though there was no official word, as soon as the passengers climbed into those dark SUVs, the hunt was on. A local news station even redirected its traffic chopper to the cause, tracking the vehicles live as they headed downtown. And they're getting now back on the garter. That helped touch off a firestorm of speculation that Kawhi Leonard was indeed back in town. And if so, why? To negotiate? To sign? A hopeful crowd gathered outside that luxury hotel where Masai Ujiri and Bobby Webster were waiting. For fans, it felt like the confirmation they needed. I'm just here to say thank you. Thank you to Kawhi. Honestly, he inspired the country. He inspired the city. The last couple months have been like so, so exciting. Social media started lighting up with such a frenzy of fan excitement bordering on obsession. Others started calling for Toronto to just chill out a little bit. Finally, the SUVs arrived at the hotel, went into the underground parking lot, and that's where the trail went cold. We don't know exactly what transpired inside the walls of this hotel here today, but for many NBA insiders, this frenzy has put the Raptors back on top when it comes to the Kawhi Leonard free agent sweepstakes. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Now, if Kawhi does resign, it'll be a blast of good news for a country that feels starved for some. Tonight, as we take another look at our pre-election survey on the mood of the nation, we focus on the next generation of voters. The CBC News poll conducted by Public Square Research and Maru Blue reveals division, pessimism, worry across the country, and about all sorts of things. Money, job security, housing, health care, the list goes on. For young Canadians, the key is climate change. More than half now call that a matter of survival, compared to just over a third of the general population. But consider this, those same young people may actually be more hopeful overall. 32% of first-time voters say they're optimistic, which is four points over the general population. And make no mistake, younger Canadians actually have the numbers to make a difference. Millennials will be the largest eligible voting bloc this time around, and that gives them power. But will they use it? Carolyn Dunn takes a look. The mission of Apathy is Boring is to get young people to the polls. Even if they know the idea of a high voter turnout for first-time voters is practically a fairy tale. To just say that they don't feel like their vote doesn't matter. Um, yeah, just... just so what's, you, what's your answer to that when someone says, my voice doesn't matter? Imagine if you all actually went out and voted, 
how different that could look. But according to the poll, more than half of first-time voters, 56 percent, say they don't know enough to cast a ballot, even though a majority of them, 57 percent, think the country is on the right track compared to 43 percent of all Canadian voters. Just never seen the need to. 21-year-old rapper Darnell Kofi didn't know the federal parties or candidates until we challenged him to Google it. It's there, right on your phone. Okay. Can you give some consideration to it? Yeah, yeah. After this, yeah. I'm going to check it out for sure. That's not to say first-time voters don't know what issues are important to them. Climate change, cost of living and school expenses top their concerns. I care about the environment and I want to have a voice in my political system. A lot of the issues for me are environmental issues, especially living in Alberta with oil and gas. Um, LGBTQ issues are big for me too, as, as well as the immigration issues that follow. Did you know the election coming up? Nationally, 8 in 10 first-time voters prioritize dealing with climate change, and more of them are willing to pay to fix it compared to the general population. But many still feel detached from what political parties are saying. The age groups are completely different in like the parties and probably their views are different than the people, the next generation coming up. But don't mistake disenchantment with the political system for cynicism because the poll found first time voters are more idealistic than the average Canadian voter. And when they do go to the polls, they tend to vote with their hearts. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And do stay with us tomorrow for more on our special series, On Guard for Me, the Uneasy Canadian. We'll hear from Indigenous people about how they see the fall election and, in some cases, how disillusionment has replaced high hopes. Okay, retail cannabis getting a big boost in Ontario. Today, the province said licenses for 42 new private stores will be handed out next month. Ontario has been quite slow to open up its legal market. At first, you could only buy online from the government store, and monthly sales averaged seven or eight million dollars. Then in April, when just a handful of private stores opened for business, total sales more than doubled. But Canada's fledgling legal cannabis industry still has its growing pain, still finding its feet. And one of its pioneering executives found that out today when he was suddenly fired. So what brought him down? Jacqueline Hansen walks us through it. From the seed of an idea to a company worth nearly $20 billion. Done. Bruce Linton helped canopy growth reach heights unmatched in Canada's cannabis industry. And he's been the face of canopy in good times and even today. I think it's my obligation on the day of departure not to hide but to actually explain uh, it's going to be good. It's a bad day for Bruce but it's not a bad day for the sector. Linton's biggest win for Canopy was landing a $5 billion investment from Constellation Brands, the company that owns Corona Beer and Kim Crawford Wines. Anybody who wants to give $5 billion for 17% of your company, you don't spend a lot of time saying, how is this going to work out for my job? In hindsight, Linton believes that deal, giving up a bigger piece of the company and seats on the board, played a role in his firing. I think there was just a whole bunch of little things that add up, and they have the right to say, we want to try it a different way. But some it's analysts say good. Linton what, sold what, a grand what, vision of the company and underdelivered. We felt it was far more promotional than operational, and when, when the operational time came, we didn't feel that there was much there. Canopy has been burning through cash, and just last quarter, it revealed a larger than expected loss. I think Constellation was left with a company that they, they ultimately made a big bet on, and when rubber hit the road and operations matter, I think they understood what they had under the hood, and it was not good. What's happening at Canopy isn't necessarily a sign of more shakeups to come at other cannabis companies, but it could take the pressure off firms that were stretching to keep up with Linton. I think we'd all take a step back here and say, listen, uh, less carnival atmosphere, uh, more just let's, uh, let's execute, show numbers, bring cash flow into the industry. That's what the industry needs, cash flow. The search is on for a new leader to keep Canopy at the forefront of an industry it helped create. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, tomorrow, the United States of America turns 243, and Washington is set for celebrations that will be a dramatic departure from the norm, courtesy of Donald Trump. The 4th of July is supposed to bring the country together, but as Ellen Morrow shows us, this particular birthday party comes with party politics. An armored vehicle on the move, a scene reminiscent of a war zone playing out in the heart of Washington, D.C. 
We're going to have a great 4th of July in Washington, D.C. It'll be like no other. It'll be special. It will certainly have a Trumpian twist. Forget just the usual fireworks show. This year's event will also feature an unusual display of military might, tanks and a flyover. Best fighter jets in the world and other planes, too. And we're going to have some tanks stationed outside. Got to be pretty careful with the tanks. President Trump will also give a speech, the first president since Nixon, to make an address as part of the formal celebrations. Nixon's, though, was videotaped. Trump's will be live from the Lincoln Memorial. In the front row, Republican donors in specially reserved seats on what's normally a nonpartisan day. It is the birthday of the country. Well, he has commandeered it. Trump dubs the event a salute to America. Critics say it's a salute to himself. It's just not done in, in this country, and it will be seen as very out of place on the grassy mall, which is used basically for flying kites. The cost? No numbers have been released, but it's expected to far surpass last year's budget, reportedly around $2 million. Anytime you get a, a presidential visit, there are inherent security costs. Back on the mall, the preparations continue for a 4th of July, unlike any the country has seen. Best thing to ever happen to this nation. Yeah, a man like Trump in there to uh, get crooked politics out of it and uh, get this country back to where it should be. I could say something about despots and uh, so-called presidents who need to show their big tanks, but I won't say it because I'm being recorded. Divided opinions in a divided America. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. So tanks are a new addition to 4th of July ceremonies, but this won't be the first time they've lumbered along the streets of Washington. You can't see them in this footage here, but in 1957, they were part of President Eisenhower's second inaugural parade, along with missiles and rows of marching soldiers. Four years later, President Kennedy's inauguration was also punctuated by a show of military muscle. But that was nothing compared to this display from 1991, complete with missile launcher to mark the end of the Gulf War. It was the largest U.S. military parade since the Second World War. A deadly airstrike in Libya appears to have hit the wrong target. At least 44 people were killed and more than 130 injured, caught in the middle of a civil war. Now, the attack tore through a detention center in a suburb of Tripoli. It held mainly African migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe. Now, the forces that call themselves the Libyan National Army say their airstrike was targeting a nearby military site, not the detention center. But even still, as you'll hear from Derek Stoffel, the United Nations says that attack could be considered a war crime. <laughs> They had come to Libya on a journey seeking a better life. Instead, these migrants from other parts of Africa were caught up in an airstrike that destroyed a detention center just outside of Tripoli. Some people were wounded and they died on the road on their way running. And some people are still under the, under the block. Hundreds had been living in the cramp building seen here before the attack. Now, some migrants who came to Libya with so little are scrounging for whatever they can take away. Libya has been in a state of chaos for the last eight years. Since the country's ruler, Muammar Gaddafi, was ousted and later killed during the Arab Spring. Canadian warplanes were part of the NATO mission to protect civilians. For the last five years, Libya has been embroiled in another civil war. This fight between the government backed by the United Nations and forces loyal to the warlord Khalifa Haftar, who leads what he calls the Libyan National Army. For the last three months, Haftar's forces have tried to take control of the capital, Tripoli. Libya is a main departure point for migrants and refugees heading to Europe. About 5,000 people are housed in detention centers after being turned back from boats in the Mediterranean Sea. 
Now, the UN's refugee agency says those migrants should be moved away from the front lines of the civil war. We have to see a change now. There has to be an immediate release of all the detainees from these centres, and we have to make sure that no rescued refugee rescued on the central Mediterranean is taken back to Libya. The UN says the attack could be a war crime, and it's now calling for a full investigation into the airstrike. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, London. Canada says it strongly condemns the airstrike on the migrant and refugee detention center in Tajura, Libya. The Twitter statement from Global Affairs goes on to say, Canada reiterates the need for a ceasefire and political reconciliation under UN-led efforts. Okay, some of the other stories we were following tonight on The National. Donald Trump is said to have raised the case of two detained Canadians with Chinese President Xi Jinping during meetings at last week's G20. Government sources say the U.S. president raised the issue, quote, in a clear and substantive way directly to the Chinese leader. However, today, China is calling those types of conversations lip service and warning Canada not to be naive in thinking that pressure from allies can resolve the dispute between the two countries. Boeing says it'll pay $100 million to families and communities affected by the deadly crashes of its 737 MAX 8 planes. In all, 346 people died in the Lion Air and Ethiopian airline crashes. Boeing is being investigated by global regulators and U.S. lawmakers over the development of the 737 MAX and is currently the defendant in more than 100 lawsuits brought forward by the families of victims. But worth noting, the money announced today is unrelated to those lawsuits. And 34 workers at a potash mine just outside of Saskatoon are now safe after being trapped in the mine for more than 24 hours. A spokesperson for Nutrient, the company that owns the mine, says the employees had been underground since Tuesday afternoon when a service shaft stopped working. The company says the workers did have an adequate supply of air, water, and food during the whole ordeal. Fourteen Russian sailors who died on board a top-secret submarine will be given state honors. They died Monday after a mysterious accident in Russia's Arctic. Now, the Kremlin says their mission was a state secret. It's refused to release details or confirm whether the sub was nuclear-powered. But as Chris Brown reveals, there are plenty of intriguing clues. Not for the first time, Murmansk residents left flowers at a memorial to mark an accident involving dead submariners. Those killed in the top secret Russian sub died of smoke yeah. inhalation, according to Russia's government. Among them, some of the most decorated officers in the nation's military, including two heroes of Russia. They sacrificed their lives to eliminate the source of the fire, save their comrades and the submersible, said Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. This is one of the few known photos of what Russian media are reporting to be the AS-12, a so-called spy sub. Nicknamed the Losharik after a cartoon horse, this Russian TV graphic shows it's usually carried by a larger vessel to its destination. Its compartmentalized hull enables it to dive deep to the ocean floor, apparently to do things such as eavesdrop on undersea communication cables. Whatever caused the fire and precisely what the mission was, Russia's leadership isn't saying. The official line is that it was a research vessel on a research mission. But this independent military analyst believes since since it was in very shallow water, most likely the vessel had just been refurbished. Now, Defense Minister Shoig already said that there was at least one civilian specialist on board, which would indicate that this was a test run just outside of the shipyard. In a tragic coincidence, the Lasherik accident happened just days after a movie about Russia's worst sub-disaster opened here. The loss of the Kursk 19 years ago left 119 sailors dead, and the fumbled response from authorities, including a young Vladimir Putin, has haunted Russia's military ever since. Russia's military has touted big plans to modernize with new missiles, ships and aircraft, but it's also suffered through major disasters, losing scores of servicemen to plane crashes in Syria and now to a fire in a submarine in the Arctic. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. And still ahead on The National, what it's like to live as a gay Muslim man in a country where that can bring violence, torture, even death. But first, a warning for dog owners and the risks of putting them on a grain-free diet. 
It is very confusing right now because everyone has an opinion. Your vet's telling you something, the people at the pet store are telling you something, everyone in the dog park has an opinion. It's a lot of people just terrified of what they're feeding their dog. Uh, am I killing my dog? Do we need to test my dog for anything? Our foods are all whole prey. That means that we use whole animal ingredients, which mimic what cats and dogs would eat in nature, in appropriate ratios of meats, organs, edible bones, and cartilage. If you feed your dog grain-free food, you should know it might not be as healthy as you think. The Food and Drug Administration in the States has put out a list of 16 pet food brands that could be linked to a potentially deadly heart disease. And that list includes two brands sold by a Canadian company, Champion. Now, since the investigation began last year, the number of reported cases jumped from just five to more than 500. About 120 dogs have died. And as Cass Rusi reports, owners are worried. For Maggie, dinner time can't come soon enough. She wastes no time gobbling up the kibble. But the Labradoodle is oblivious to the ongoing investigation by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The agency is looking into a potential link between some dog foods labeled grain-free and a rare canine heart disease. Fielding tons of phone calls about it. This vet is hearing from anxious owners. It's a lot of people just terrified of what they're feeding their dog. Uh, am I killing my dog? Do we need to test my dog for anything? Canada's Champion Pet Foods manufacture two of the brands on the FDA list. A statement posted on Champion's website says it is misleading for the FDA to post the names of brands, while at the same time fully stating they have no scientific evidence linking diet to dilated canine cardiomyopathy. The Canadian government doesn't regulate pet food, leaving that up to the industry. The only regulation it does have is with labeling. You could put anything in a bag and call it dog food, um, as long as your manufacturer name and contact details are on the bag. Alex Richardson feeds his dog, Rocket, grain-free meals, and so far, he hasn't run into any health issues. In fact, like uh, the food that they gave us from the OSPCA where we adopted them. Yeah. Um, we switched it out because it was full of grains and stuff and we thought we were doing, you know, the good thing. You're perfect. You're perfect, little lady. Vets say these days owners want their pets to eat the way they do. A lot of people trends will end up moving over into the animal uh, world. So all the low carb diets are like, oh, if it's good for me, it's gotta be good for my dogs. But ultimately, what is good for your dog, he says, is a balanced diet full of protein and carbs. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead on The National, keeping the streets safe for pedestrians and cyclists. The lessons we can learn from New York City. And in our dispatch from Russia, one gay man opens up about the persecution he faced and his journey to freedom. Ну, угрожали, что типа если ещё раз увидим, убьём, там зарежем, такие слова, такие. International Pride Month may be over, but take a good look around the world and you start to see in very stark terms just how far from equality we really are. So take a look at this. Member states of the United Nations that criminalize same-sex relationships. There are more than 70 of them, and many impose extreme punishments from imprisonment to death. But even outside of that group, consider Russia. Same-sex relationships, not explicitly criminal, but LGBTQ people have no protections either. And that gray area can be just as dangerous. We've reported on anti-gay crackdowns in that country in recent years, where men suspected of being gay or bisexual have been detained, beaten, tortured, even killed. Enter Orhan, a man whose name we've changed for his safety. In tonight's dispatch from the Caucasus region, he opens up to Chris Brown about the persecution he's faced and his efforts to escape it.
In a country largely intolerant of homosexuality, Russia's Caucasus region is one of its most intolerant places. I was in a magazine, and when I came to the camera, they took me out of here. They did an operation here. This is Orhan, and when we talked to him, he was essentially a prisoner in his own home. They threatened me that if we see another time, we'll kill them, we'll kill them. It's rare for any gay man in Russia to admit it publicly, but it's unheard of for a gay man from this region to go on camera and talk about it. Orhan's case is exceptional, though. He was a well-known aspiring singer who was violently outed as being gay. One night after a performance, he received texts from a man inviting him for a walk along the beach. When he arrived, thugs jumped him and turned on their cameras. In Russia, if you're gay, you're often also labeled as a child molester too. The video cuts out just as the thugs bash him in the head. They beat me, then it was bad for me. They beat me with some water. They tried to extort him, demanding money, and when he couldn't pay, they posted the shakedown video on YouTube. Within hours, he says he lost everything. Even his closest family members said he'd be better off just to kill himself. Orhan says he went to the police, but the thugs got off with impunity, and by then it was too late anyway. The video was viewed over a hundred thousand times, and there was no hiding that he was gay. До этого были такие маленькие разговоры, ну такие неуверенные, да? Может быть, может не быть, вот такие разговоры были. Но уже когда вот вышло это видео, потом все уже поняли, ой. As tragic and awful as all that is, there's more. Orhan is married. He and his wife have a baby with another child on the way. In such conservative societies, he says many gay men get married because it's safer. Orhan's wife told us she lives in fear. Delicately, we asked her about the video and about her husband's double life. She doesn't address it directly. Orhan says he believes his wife has always understood his sexual orientation and she accepts it. Она мне сказала, что я буду тебя любить таким, какой ты есть. Мне без разницы, ты в теме, ты не в теме. Так я тоже не смогу их предать. When we did this interview, they were desperate. Desperate for money, desperate to feel safe, and desperate to get out. Надежда на том, что, может, мы... Да, может, заберут туда. That help came from Russia's LGBT network. When they learned about Orhan's situation, they got him and his family plane tickets to leave the Caucasus. The network was instrumental in helping dozens of gay Russian men flee to Canada in 2018 after authorities in Chechnya began rounding up and torturing gay men. They found Orhan a temporary place to live. They're still in Russia, but we're not going to say where. 
свободно, свобода чувствуется чуть-чуть. То, что со мной сделали, это, это катастрофа, это вообще, э, как говорят, громкое преступление. А за громкое преступление никакого наказания не было. Почему? Потому что я и раньше говорил, к большому сожалению, все покупается. С удовольствием уехал бы. Так-то разницы нет, куда. Туда, где нас как бы более цивилизованную страну, так скажем, Канаду или же куда-нибудь. Крис Браун, CBC News, in Russia's Caucasus. And still ahead on the national vision zero. How New York City is hoping to eliminate all traffic-related deaths and injuries and what Canadian cities need to know. There's no reason to accept as just the cost of doing business or the status quo, the fact that people are going to get hit and killed or injured in traffic. It's a way of realizing that we can engineer out the consequences of human error. But first, here's a look at a story we'll have later this week on The National. From dirty fuel to electric engines, how ships are increasingly plugging in to shore. Here's Greg Rasmussen with a preview. On the surface, it's like many of the vessels working the BC coast, moving freight, delivering Canadian cargo. Yeah, very modern. But below decks, it's not your normal oil-burning engine. This is the battery room. Wow, okay, that's a lot of batteries. Yeah, a lot of batteries. The Reliant is a hybrid, partly powered by electricity, much like a Toyota Prius. As with many different modes of transportation now, we're seeing electrification. Um, so in this case, we have diesel engines combined with batteries, uh, and it's definitely the way of the future. Almost one million people are being ordered to evacuate their homes in Japan due to heavy rains in the region. The southern island of Kyushu has been battered by downpours since Friday, with more of them expected in the coming days. A number of areas are under extreme risk of flooding and landslides, and at least one person has been killed so far. In India, heavy monsoon rains are being blamed for the deaths of at least 30 people since Monday night. Local train and bus services have been disrupted, schools were closed, and nearly 50 flights were cancelled from Mumbai airport. That city, the country's financial capital, has come to a standstill as it tries to deal with the heaviest monsoon rains in a decade. A big music festival happening north of Toronto has been cancelled just a week before it was set to get underway. Aerosmith, Nickelback, Kid Rock and Alice Cooper were all set to perform at the Roxodus Festival. But organizers say wet weather going back to the spring has prevented them from getting the venue ready in time. Roxodus says it will provide information about refunds soon, but didn't give many more details than that. The cartoon is set to replace Michael Deatter in Brunswick newspapers, says he will not be drawing editorial cartoons for the chain after all. Greg Perry says he was approached in early June to replace Deatter. Deatter's relationship was ended after he shared a cartoon on social media depicting Donald Trump playing golf next to the bodies of two migrants. Perry says the social media backlash against him for being tapped to replace Deatter has taken a toll. At this point, I gotta say, there's definitely an appearance of uh, usage of uh, excessive force, and I am not comfortable with that as mayor. The mayor of Montreal wants answers about the arrest of a young black man that was caught on video. The cell phone footage shows a young man in handcuffs being thrust to the ground outside a metro station on Monday, but the officer says 
they were responding to a complaint. Beyond that, no comment from the Montreal police. They're still looking into what happened. Well, as of mid-June, 11 pedestrians have died on the streets of Toronto so far this year. So police are stepping up efforts to keep people safe this summer. An additional 300 officers will be deployed across the city looking for bad drivers. And the city has a plan too. It's launched the next phase of Vision Zero with the goal of reducing traffic-related deaths and injuries. The concept was developed in Sweden and found some success in New York. So tonight, we're revisiting a story by Stephen D'Souza on how it can work. New York knows a thing or two about congestion. With more than eight and a half million people, there's a constant crush of pedestrians, cyclists, and cars. But here's the thing. While many North American cities are seeing a rise in pedestrian and cycling deaths, New York is bucking the trend. It's seen a remarkable turnaround in the last four years, and it didn't happen by accident. So how did they do it? New York officials went all in on Vision Zero, and they're getting results. Let's break down what New York did by looking at five major changes, beginning with road redesign. This is Queens Boulevard, once known as the Boulevard of Death because of the number of cyclists and pedestrians killed or injured here. Since it's redesign though, it's become the poster child for Vision Zero because that number of deaths has gone down to zero. Lanes here were narrowed, and traffic flow was at times redirected. Bike lanes were also installed, but in the center, away from parked cars and buses. Crosswalks were also shortened by widening the medians. It's a walking city. You don't need a car in order to have you know, a really active life here. Julia Kite is with New York City's Department of Transportation. If we could fix Queens Boulevard, if we could bring it from you know, the boulevard of death to a place where people want to walk and want to bike, then really nothing is impossible. And that's really she says the key to making Vision Zero a success yeah, is operating with the actual goal of zero deaths. There's no reason to accept is just the cost of doing business or the status quo, the fact that people are going to get hit and killed or injured in traffic. It's a way of realizing that we can engineer out the consequences of human error. And while we can never completely eliminate people making mistakes, we can make sure that those mistakes don't have catastrophic consequences. Take the engineering behind crosswalks like this. The priority is the safety of those on foot. Pedestrians get the green light first and a head start on turning cars. Another major part of road redesign here is an emphasis on bike lanes. Cycling is a major piece of New York's success. A quick look at their bike share program tells the story. With the number of cyclists dramatically increasing in recent years, the city has had to work to make space for them. But officials say there's no one magic bullet. It's a combination of things, and that includes traffic enforcement. The city increased the number of traffic tickets issued by nearly 40%. Does that make a difference? CBC crunched the numbers and discovered that in Toronto, as the number of traffic tickets declined, the number of cyclists and pedestrian fatalities increased. A major part of Vision Zero here is also controlling speed. Default speed limits were reduced to 25 miles per hour, or about 40 kilometers, and they put in more oversight. One of the tools to control speed are these cameras, which can be found in school zones across the city. Now, the data shows that they've cut speeding during school hours by more than half, and injuries have gone down too. The evidence shows that even just the difference between being hit at 30 miles per hour versus being hit at 25 miles per hour makes a tremendous difference in a pedestrian's odds of surviving.
But despite the success, the speed cameras went dark this summer, the victim of a battle between lawmakers, a sign that the kind of change needed for Vision Zero takes a lot of political will. Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, campaigned on Vision Zero. When we lowered the speed limit, a lot of people said the sky would fall. Well, it didn't. Most New Yorkers recognized it was making people safer. And I certainly heard the grumbling from a lot of drivers, and I respect that. But I also heard a lot of people, including drivers, say, you know what? I don't love it, but it works. Projects like this don't always go smoothly. There's usually opposition, and New York is no different in that respect. But because of the political will behind Vision Zero, work like this often goes ahead anyway. New Yorkers have also had to learn that they may not all get their way. Headlines reflect a recent battle over the elimination of parking for bike lanes. When the community board voted against bike lanes, the mayor stepped in and overruled them. A small win to safety advocates like Evan Weiss. These bike lanes are tiny slivers in a city that's just crisscrossed with parkways, expressways, parking lots, parking garages, everything. Eben Weiss writes a cycling blog. He says part of the challenge of making Vision Zero work is bringing voices of change together. The silent majority of people everywhere want to be safe. They want to get around without being run over. And uh, uh, the hard part is getting people together to, to help push the, the, the changes that, that, that will make that happen. But constructing change comes with a price, and New Yorkers have had to pony up. For all its success and flaws, Eben Weiss says New York can offer a vision of what's possible. It takes somebody to open your eyes to how far you ha we have to go and how much better things can be and how much effort that actually takes to kind of turn that switch on in people and say, I'm going to do something about it. Make no mistake, Vision Zero is very much a work in progress here. It's hotly debated and always controversial but the results speak for themselves. The last time New York City streets were this safe, people were getting around with a horse and buggy. So in the entire era of the automobile, we're at the safest point we've ever been. Of course, drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists will always have strong opinions. The difference in New York City, they're not letting that get in the way, and they're not standing still. And one more note on this story. Vision Zero has faced a setback in New York this year. There's been a spate of cyclist deaths in recent weeks, which the mayor has called an emergency. But he insists Vision Zero was working and the city's planning to deploy more police officers to crack down on drivers. Okay, up next on The National, will he stay or will he go? The clock is ticking and that has even very young Raptors fans looking for unique ways to persuade the King of the North. Her message to Kawhi next in our moment. Kawhi Leonard is being offered the world right now to stay with the Toronto Raptors. And two Toronto sisters wanted to help convince him to sign on. You're going to meet Carissa and Serena. They're seven and five, and their message to Kawhi is pretty simple. It's pretty, too, and it's tonight's moment. Kawhi, they won't love you like we love you. Kawhi, they won't love you like we love you. What inspired us to do the video? is we wanted to do our part to keep Kawhi in Toronto, and it was just a fun way to try hoping Kawhi would see it. What we like about Kawhi is that he's, he's a good player, and, he, and we think that he's the one that brought us to the championships this year. That he's a good player. Um, I think Ka what Kawhi brings to the team, um, I think he brings good luck, and he's a really good player. Toronto has a Supermax for you. To celebrate, we, we would probably have a big party and we'd be like, 
Yay! He made him stay and it would be fun. Oh, gosh, so, so two things. A, uh, that's adorable, and B, now I, I really hope that, that Kawhi Leonard ends up staying in Toronto. Uh, if not for the sake of all of the Raptors fans and for the sake of the city, then at least for the sake of, of those two young girls. But, but here's the thing. I mean, tonight we didn't get official word one way or the other whether Kawhi Leonard was going to stay or whether he was going to go. We may get that tomorrow, but there's certainly no guarantee of that. So everyone, just be patient. Buckle in and breathe. That's the National for this July 3rd. Have a good night.